Hello and welcome to Dark Mode. Today we're going to take a look at another Model Y Basics video. And we're going to cover the center screen. And this will apply to both the Model Y and the Model 3 as the software sits in early June of 2021. So if you're already familiar with the screen and interface, this video might not be for you and you might want to pick up back with our channel when we do another road trip or some other features you're more interested in. But for those of you who are new to Tesla and want to get your head wrapped around what's in that big screen, this is going to be the video for you. Now there's a lot to cover, but it's pretty intuitive once you kind of get the walkthrough. Now I filmed this last night in my garage, so we wouldn't be having uh, brightness changes on the screen, and it would be pretty easy to follow along without a lot of glare. I'm gonna kind of do a little commentary and give you the highlights and hopefully speed it up for you. But speaking of speeding it up, let's get to it and get into that interface. And we're going to get started right here on the left hand side of our screen and you can see the car avatar here and we can open the front we can open the rear trunk or we can open the charge port we're plugged in right now so that icon is grayed out and we can lock the vehicle with a little lock symbol on top now i'm in the vehicle as i'm recording this so don't need to lock it but if you are camping in the vehicle Overnight, you are going to want to lock that. And so you can either do that here on the screen or in the app from the back seat. And here we see the little lightning icon and showing us we are ready to charge. We're plugged in. And if we tap that, it brings up the charging panel. And we're going to walk through that a little bit later. But for right now, let's just close it out. Then on the upper right section of this panel, you can see our battery percentage is at 57%. And you can see that little battery icon there as well. On the top left hand side right now, because we are plugged in and I have the car scheduled to finish charging, it says ready to depart by 8 a.m. On the lower part of the screen, you see these three dots. And if we swipe that to the right, you will see your odometer panel come up. And that is going to show you on the top end your last trip. So here we have the miles traveled, the number of minutes that trip took, and your average watt hour per mile. And some of those battery basics might be for another video, but right now I'm just going to call them out. And if you click on these dots, you can reset that. Scrolling down a little bit, you can see since your last charge. So I charged up this morning and since then have done a few trips during the day. So you can see the distance traveled, your kilowatt hours used, and your average watt hour per mile. Recently, my family and I went on a trip to Custer, South Dakota, and so we were able to set this up as its own trip. Now, we've driven a lot of miles since this, so this isn't accurate to that trip, but it helped us keep track during the trip. And so here again, you see the miles, the kilowatt hours used, and the average watt hour per mile and you can reset the trip name or reset the trip in total, uh, again, by clicking those three dots in the upper right. And then down below, I have the second trip you can set up, set up as my lifetime. So since we bought the car, how are we doing? How many miles have we traveled? How many kilowatt hours have we used? And what's our average my watt hour per mile lifetime? You could also set this up as a trip B, so there are options if you like to do it a different way. And you do have your full odometer down below on the last panel as you're scro scrolling down here. So we'll close that panel, swipe it to the left, swipe to the left again, and you bring up another panel that shows your tire pressures. I'm not going to wait for this to load. I think you may have to have been driving for a little bit to get these pressures to show up, but we don't need to deal with it now, just know that it's there. Now at this point I am going to get out of the vehicle, unplug, and we'll take a look at some of the things that change when you are not plugged in and then when you put the vehicle in gear. So I got back in the vehicle, put my foot on the brake, and I have pin to drive set up so it asked me for my pin and then once that came up, I was able to see the driving options. And here on the upper left, 
you can see uh, park, reverse, neutral, and drive as options. And those are controlled on the gear stock behind the steering wheel. So I'll put it in drive here and my seatbelt wasn't on so I'll click that to get rid of that little screen. And you can see the car is not happy with us uh, being in the closed garage. It is warning us not to drive pretty much anywhere. Uh, but you can see you can move that little avatar around as you're driving but most of the time you're just going to leave it as it is. And you can see also on the top left uh, it's showing miles per hour. Again we're not going anywhere in this video so it's showing zero and you can see the red warnings all around the car. We shouldn't go anywhere. The nice thing about that placement and what you can't see in this video is that miles per hour display is right to the right of your steering wheel as you're in the driving position. And so it's very convenient to just look over your right hand as your hands are at 10 and 2. Just look over and see your speed. Uh, I know there's a lot of concern about new owners. Am I going to be able to find that easily? Is it going to be obvious? And you do adapt to it very quickly. So all that stuff on the left side is handy, but really simple, again, once you know what's all there. Now let's take a look at the map area, and we'll start uh, right up by our battery icon that we looked at before, and we can see that there's a little vehicle lock showing us that the car is currently unlocked. Then we see the current time, and you can set up how you like that displayed and the temperature, again, which you can set to Fahrenheit or Celsius, depending on how you prefer it. Then we have the user profile, which I'll show you how to set that up in a couple minutes. Um, and then we have a little circle that right now has a white center, but if you click that, it's the center of it turns red and turns sentry mode on. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. I'm in my garage and so no need to have sentry mode on and uh, that's again another setting you can do. The next icon is the sentry, the dash cam sentry mode viewer or a place where you can save a clip. If you get into an accident or something happens around you, you can click that button to save a clip. Now there's another way to do that with the horn and we'll show how to set that up a little bit later. So let's take a look at that dash cam viewer, and right now I'm in the garage, everything's dark, there's nothing to see outside. But if we tap on these little lines, it brings us previous clips that are on the USB drive. So let's take a look at a clip from when we were at the Badlands, parked, sentry mode was on, we were off walking the trails, and you can see the different camera angles there. We've got the front view, back view, right camera, left camera, and so we can toggle through the different views there, and then you'll see a red dot where the incident that triggered sentry mode happened. And if we move up to that point, we can see on the front screen that a couple walked really close to the front of the car, didn't do anything, didn't damage it, didn't probably even touch it, but it was close enough for sentry mode to record the event. And most sentry mode clips are like that. It's just someone was nearby, woke the car up and wanted to make sure nothing bad was happening. But I'd rather have that happen and then when something bad happens actually have the clip, then it'd be really hard to trigger. So pretty good safety feature that's really helped a lot of people who have keyed cars, damaged cars, backed into cars, uh, get caught by the authorities. So it's one of the features that I absolutely love about Tesla. Then you can see right now we're on LTE connection and not much connection, but uh, we'll switch to Wi-Fi a little bit later when we go into some of the other functions. That will be displayed in that same place. And then Bluetooth and showing no one's in the passenger seat, so the passenger airbag is off. So now we've made it through a large part of the screen and you can see all of it's pretty simple once you know what it is. Now let's take a look at some of the map settings. Here in the upper right corner of the map we have, it's a little hard to see, but we have our direction indicator showing that we are facing north currently, and that will change. You can either set it up to always point north, 
or to follow your vehicle. So again, that's a preference that you'll have to play with and see which display you prefer. You can also enlarge your map or shrink it depending on what you like with the plus and minor, minus keys. Here you can, this little world icon will show you the satellite view. Um, it's a little bright right now, but we'll uh, switch it back over to the wireframe view that's maybe a little easier to follow. Uh, then you can turn traffic indications on and off with that traffic light icon and then search for chargers nearby. So right now, this is bringing up all the superchargers that are in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Uh, all of them I could get to easily if I needed to with the remaining charge I have. And it shows how fast each of the chargers is and how many stalls are available at those places, as well as how far away they are. And if I want to pick one, I just click on it, and it navigates me there and would usually start preconditioning the battery if I'm nearby to get it nice and warm so I have a fast charge. If you need to get anywhere else or find a specific charger or a level two charger, you can either navigate with this navigate search tool or use a voice command. Now here we'll kind of scroll down and you can see some of the different places I've navigated to recently. Uh, all the way back to our trip to Custer and some of the superchargers between them. So really handy and like I said, usually I'm doing this with a voice command. You can also set up your home or your work as a place. A lot of times if I'm in an unknown area and I know I just need the fastest route home, I'll navigate home even though you know, once we get to the main highways I know where I'm going. It just simplifies getting out of the weeds in unfamiliar areas. So you have a few tabs down here. You have recents, favorites, if you want to set some places, family members' homes as favorites or something. If you click hungry, it'll show you dining options. I recorded this at 11 at night and it wants to go to Taco Bell. I can't imagine why, but um, that's pretty funny. And then lucky, you can click that and it usually will take you someplace nearby. That's kind of an interesting attraction. Um, here it takes us to the gum wall in Seattle, which is a little bit of a too big of an adventure for the middle of the night and living in Minnesota. But you can click that a few different times, see if there's some fun uh, unexpected trips you want to take uh, just by feeling lucky. And then you can either cancel that navigation or click on the little directional arrow up in the top right hand corner of the, the map to get you back to your location. Now before we move on, let's go back and take a look at the user profile. And let's set up a new one, we'll call it test. And you can say, you can set up the mirrors using the left scroll wheel on the steering wheel to get the mirrors right into the right place for you. You can also set up mirror auto tilt or mirror auto fold, depending on what you like and you know how you use your vehicle. Then you can also adjust the steering wheel, again using that left hand scroll wheel. Now because I'm setting up a new profile, this did go back to auto screen settings, and so we lost some of our brightness, but uh, I'll bump that up here and again in a second. And you can also adjust your seat to the position you like, and it will save with your profile as well. And some people will set up multiple different profiles just for themselves. If you're the kind of person who likes to use the screen for gaming or watching Netflix, you might have it set up one way or a different way for uh, road trip driving, another way for track driving if you're that kind of person. Um, so you can set up multiple different profiles, but obviously there is a limit, and if you're sharing the vehicle with someone else, you don't want to use up all the profiles just for your convenience. You can adjust things from your profile and then either choose to save them or not. All right, time for a little check-in. How are you doing? Is this making good sense to you? Hopefully, as you see this, this is all kind of making sense, and you're able to follow along where we're going. Um, it's not too bad, again, once you know what you're looking at. 
Now we're going to dive in to the bottom row. So you might need to kind of shake it out a little bit and get ready for this. But I have to tell you, like the other sections, this is really a lot easier than it seems. So as we approach the bottom row, we're actually going to start on the right hand side and move toward the left because a lot of these are some really basic functions that don't take a lot of explanations and we can just get them out of the way. So let's get back into it. So first on the far right, like I said, we've got the volume control, which is very simple, up, down, and really that's for the passenger to use. You will most likely as the driver be using the left steering wheel stock to adjust volume. You can also do that through a voice command. Then we have rear defrost, and then we've got the forward defrost or defogger, hot or cold, and usually kicks things on pretty high pretty fast. Then we've got the seat heaters, so you can do these either by voice command, my butt is cold, or just touching the icon here. And then we've got the temperature control. Uh, right now we're set to 72. You can bump that up or down depending on what you need, obviously. Then we'll bring up the fan speed and air conditioning panel. So usually I leave this in auto and just adjust the temperature, but you can set it to manual and change your fan speed manually with the air conditioning. Here I'm turning it off for the sake of audio. And then when you leave the car, you can even either set it to leave off, on, if you've got people in the vehicle, and then dog mode, which is the same thing. It leaves the climate on, but it brings up a screen on the center screen when you close the door with a little balloon animal dog, and it says, my owner will be back soon. Temperature in the vehicle is, in this case, 72 degrees. And that just lets anyone walking by know that the dogs are safe and comfortable or whatever pet you have. Uh, this keeps people from walking by and smashing your windows thinking they're saving your pet, which did happen quite a bit before they enabled this feature. So really handy one from Tesla there. And then we've got camp mode, which again, will leave the climate on wherever you have set. And after a few minutes, it will bring up this cute little camping scene with a little fireplace. And I think there's a cyber truck in the background and everything, um, some fun Easter eggs in there. And then eventually that will, screen will go to pretty much black with just the little white text saying camp mode. And so I've used this a few different times, sleeping in the vehicle overnight, very handy. Now with, I think all of these settings, that will switch off after you reach 20% battery. So you don't want to let it get too low or leave your dogs in there without uh, enough charge to keep that climate at that temperature. Um, so just something to be aware of. And I think that warning pops up each time, just letting you know this will only work till 20%. So either have enough charge or make a plan. And you see the little airflow area here, you can control, move that around, manipulate that. If we had a passenger, they could do theirs as well. Just get it how they like it. And then you can also, you know, switch on different fan levels, the, you know, the feet, the, the stuff more in your face as well. You can also schedule the heat or air to come on, you know, before you get off work. You might want to come out to a cool car and not have to remember to set that up on the app before you leave your desk. Now, something that caught me off guard when I first got the vehicle was not realizing that there were two tabs here on the left hand side. And so we've been looking at the fan tab, but if we look at these little three little bacon strips and here you can just by touching manually turn on all the seat heaters or you know cycle them down to the right level for each passenger or yourself. Uh, again, you can do some of this with voice commands as well. And our vehicle has the benefit of having the steering wheel heater. And so this would be, again, the screen where you turn that on if you're not using voice commands. And because I do a lot of recording in the car and the fan can be sort of noisy, you can press and hold the fan icon and it will shut itself off or if you want to bring it back on, just touch it again 
and it will kick the fan back on to whatever setting you left it on. I'm going to skip over this little carrot icon and go all the way back to the left and we'll start working our way back toward that. And this first icon on the left is the car icon and that brings up all of your basics. It's closest to the driver, very easy to access. And other than the audio settings, this is the panel you're probably going to use most. And so here are the quick controls, which are just some quick basics. Then you can set lights, locks, display, driving, autopilot, navigation, safety and security, service, and software. And then at the bottom, we have the glove box icon. And that's just your quick glove box button. So uh, a lot of people are concerned that there isn't a physical button to open the glove box, but it's a quick two taps with the car icon and then hitting glove box to pop that open or like most other things a voice command of open glove box and it'll pop open. So let's do a quick rundown of those quick controls. Here we can see you can set the exterior lights to auto or you know some different setting you might prefer. Uh, you can turn on the exterior front fog lights adjust the mirrors, the steering wheel, uh, the window locks. Now these are for the back windows. My daughter likes to hit buttons and bring these down when we're cruising down the interstate and it can be a little startling and wouldn't want her to drop something out the window without me knowing it. So I want control of that. I keep those window locks on. And then you can adjust your display brightness as well. And here you can see for the purpose of this video, I have it cranked all the way up so the image isn't too noisy in camera. So then we jump into the lights tab and you can see headlights again set to auto. They're off in the garage right now, but um, usually I set those to auto. Um, you can again do your front fog lights. You can set your dome, dome lights. I believe I have mine set to auto. Uh, we are still in the test profile, so they're set to off here. Ambient lights are your footwell lights and things like that. You can turn those on or off, again, depending on your preference or your needs. Auto high beam. When you put your high beams on, it does the auto uh, dim. I don't use high beams too often, but when I do, I want that backup extra set of, you know, watching out to make sure I'm not blinding other people. You can also leave your headlights set to stay on after you exit. The steering wheel lights are just little arrow icons next to your thumb scroll wheels on the steering wheel and I don't really see a use for them. I can feel with my fingers where they are and once you've driven for a while you know right where those uh, thumb buttons are so um, it's cute that they're there but I don't see a use for them. Then we move down to the lock screen and here you can see my phone, my wife's phone, and our two key cards that came with the vehicle. And so those are the ways we can currently get into our car. At the bottom again we have the window lock icon and the child lock icon. Again because of my daughter loving to press buttons I want those both turned on. So those locks stay closed, the windows stay closed, the doors stay closed, all of that. One little tip if you are camping in the back of your car and sleeping back there, you are going to want to change the child lock to off. If you forget to turn the child locks off, you're going to have the uncomfortable squirming between the front two seats to get up to access the screen and turn child locks off so you can get out through the back doors. And it's not the most pleasant situation. Not that it's ever happened to me. And if we scroll down a little more, you can see the walkaway door lock, which I have on. So as soon as my phone gets a certain distance away from the car, it'll lock itself. I don't have to worry about it. And then I have unlock on park set. So if I am picking up my wife or someone, I know I just have to stop, put it in park. The door's unlocked. They can get in. Um, depending on your level of comfort and where you live, you may or may not want to have that toggled on. And then we come to some notifications if your car is left open. Um, I have both a notification if the doors or windows are left open and so that just pops up on my phone and I can either say oh yeah I knew 
I left that open intentionally or I need to get back to my car fast because it's wide open. And you can toggle that on to either exclude home or not. I also like to keep the lock confirmation sound on. So as I'm walking into the grocery store, I just in the back of my head hear that little chime, the little honk, and I know I'm locked up. Some people don't like to have that on and just look back to make sure that the mirrors have folded in, indicating that the vehicle's locked. But in the winter time, it's a good idea if you live in very cold areas where you get freezing snow, freezing rain, it's a good idea to turn that folding mirror off uh, so you don't damage the motors if they were to freeze up. Um, so again, in the winter, this is just a nice way I know my car is locked when I'm walking away. And you can see I have not chosen to close windows on lock, but that's a nice option if that's something you need. On the display tab, you can see we can either have day mode, night mode, which we're in right now, or have it switch on its own when it sees the ambient light around the car is, uh, yeah, when you hit dusk, it goes into night mode. When you hit daybreak, it would go into day mode. And so I leave it at auto. It seems to do a pretty good job in most situations. Uh, again, screen brightness, we've talked about this a couple times. Right now it's at 100%, usually I have it set to auto. Uh, screen clean mode, this is a great way to get all those fingerprints off of your screen. And so you touch that and then as you're wiping down the screen with a microfiber cloth or something, you can touch all around the screen and it's not going to bring up menus or change a setting on you. It'll just clean the screen. And then you press and hold the button for a few seconds to bring it back to where it was. Below that, we've got our language selection. I'm in the US using English for everything. Obviously, you'll know what language you speak. But if you're watching this video, I hope you understand English or this is incredibly boring. Even if you do, even if you do speak English, this might be incredibly boring. Now, when we were looking at uh, some of the icons on the top of the screen, we were talking about how you can change how you display the time. So this is where you would do that. Energy display, I'll come back to in a second. Uh, distance, if you like to see kilometers or miles. Temperature, Celsius or Fahrenheit or tire pressure in bar or PSI. Like most of these things, these are settings you set up when you get the vehicle and then never really think about again. But I do wanna come back to this energy display. And this changes how the battery icon on the left-hand side of the screen above the car avatar shows your uh, remaining range. Generally, I have it set to energy, which shows a percentage of battery left. I believe when the vehicles are delivered, they are set to distance. And I encourage most people to switch it to energy and just see the percentage. Distance will show the miles, but it seems to show the miles of the battery as if you are getting the full EPA rating of the range. And so, if you're in a non-ideal situation, going in non-ideal speed and non-ideal weather, elevation changes, your miles are not going to be real accurate. For instance, you might drive a couple miles up a mountain and you've gone two miles in reality and it's taken, you know, like six miles off of this distance. That would be some pretty good mountain climbing. Generally, it's not that bad. Or if you're on the interstate going 80 miles an hour into a headwind, you might see two miles come off for every mile you're traveling. And that can be pretty disconcerting. So I'll show you a different way to see what your real miles are here in a second. But for peace of mind, I would set this to percentage. Think of it like your cell phone, or if you're coming from a gas car, your gas gauge, you know, 25% is a quarter tank. You know, 75% is three quarters of a tank. So it's much more natural to the way we think about capacity and batteries and will eliminate a lot of stress. A lot of people first get their Teslas and a month later they're concerned that when they charge to 100%, this uh, mileage is not showing what the rated mileage for the vehicle is. 
and that might be a consistency thing with the way they're they've been driving or some of their charging habits or things and they get really worked up about it like what's happening to my battery generally it's nothing and not worth worrying about uh, and if you set it to percentage and you know take decent care of your battery again that's for another video but if you do those things set it to percentage and you just don't worry but as i said i will show you in a little bit how to gauge a really accurate sense of how many miles you have remaining so i know i went on a little tangent there but trust me this is an important thing that people do tend to worry about when they're new owners in the driving tab we can take a look at some of the really fun stuff setting up the driving style and experience to how you prefer it you can do chill acceleration if you have a lead foot where you're always popping off the line and you want to dial that back and maybe not make your passengers seasick uh, chill mode will help you do that right now i have mine set to standard the steering mode comfort to me is a little too sloshy um, it feels like the car is bigger and not really gripping the road even though it is i found that to be a little too soft for me standards pretty good that's how i drive most of the time sports nice and grippy and you know you feel pretty connected to the road and so if we're doing mountain driving or some really fun stuff i'll snap it into sport mode there stopping mode i leave it on creep because i'm a creep uh, but i like the sense of when you're, you're driving an internal combustion engine and you have that idling you let your foot off the brake and the car will roll a little bit and uh, you know i like that it feels natural to me uh, a lot of people who drive electric don't but it's my preference uh, roll will you know roll on an incline or decline uh, when you take your foot off the brake and hold will just stop when you are at a stop you lift your foot off the brake it's not going to move until you touch the accelerator hold will actually give you the most out of one pedal driving it'll take that regen as far as it possibly can and then blend in the brakes for that last tiny bit so if you want to maximize your regen use hold uh, but i'm not as comfortable driving that way so in general i keep it on creep and then we've got a couple little off-road assist toggles here so off-road assist if you're on a trail or gravel or something like that you might want to throw that on and then slip start if you're having issues and you're stuck in snow or sand or mud or something you can turn that on and that'll help get you out and the autopilot tab and here is the big headline news area and so let's walk through this now as you toggle any of these on if there are a new feature that changes the safety of the vehicle it's going to bring up a warning and tell you exactly what it does what it doesn't do and explains to you that you are in control a lot of headlines are generated about people abusing autopilot or Tesla's not being safe enough and this is kind of the area where the media tends to get confused people who don't own a Tesla uh, think that there are no warnings and you get in these cars and people just don't know what to do people should be reading these disclaimers and taking precautions at this point the vehicles are not self-driving they are very good assistive features but you are in control and as you toggle each one of these you say yes i am going to be in control i understand what these uh, disclaimers mean so auto steer is basically lane keeping adaptive cruise control and uh, some of the basics of autopilot navigate on autopilot will be where you can navigate to a location and it will take you from right now from highway entrance ramp to the highway exit in most cases and we'll do some of the interchanges for you again with you monitoring it making sure it's changing lanes safely and you can set that up how you like it we'll look at those in a second 
So let's take a look at some of the options within Navigate on Autopilot that you can set up, again, to customize how you prefer it. Enable at the start of every trip. I have no, again, we're still kind of at the ends of COVID here, and we're not going consistent places. Most of my trips are around town. I'm not using Navigate on Autopilot that often that I want it, you know, trying to come on for every trip. If I were back doing a 9 to 5 thing and going to the same places all the time and traveling on highways, I would probably have that changed. And then speed-based lane changes, you can have the vehicle decide when it thinks it needs to change lanes. You can either turn that off, have it set to mild, average, or mad max. I find in the real world, mild especially, and even average, will put the signal on and then take forever to actually take action on that signal. Where Mad Max turns it on, gives it even maybe a little too long still in Mad Max, and then does move over relatively quickly. So um, right now that's the most aggressive uh, driving style, but I think for most humans it wouldn't seem that aggressive. It seems pretty natural or like I said, even a little slow. So right now Mad Max is the way to go for me. Exit passing lane, everyone should turn this one on because you don't want to be the guy who's hanging out in the passing lane with a line of cars up behind you and you're not getting over. So yes, I would encourage everyone to enable this one. I require lane change confirmation, so I have to give it a little tug with the steering wheel to let it know it's okay to do the move it wants to. And you can have it do a chime or a vibration of the steering wheel when it gives you that notification. I originally had them both on because I wanted to be a super safe guy. And what it turned out to be is just panic inducing because all of a sudden it flips on the blinker, starts vibrating the steering wheel, is dinging at you. And my wife's going, what's going on? And I'm going, what's going on? Oh, we just want to change lanes? Yeah, okay. Um, so after one trip with that enabled, I shut it down and just do the steering wheel to confirm. It's pretty obvious when it wants to change lanes, and so I keep an eye on that. You'll also see a lot of these options have these little info tabs. So if you want more details, an in-depth look at what each of these settings mean, toggle those on, read it thoroughly, and really understand what you're getting into, when you're in control, what the vehicle wants to do, and you'll know when it's time to take over. And then I also like to, you know, kind of be, see where we are on the cutting edge of things. So I have traffic light and stop sign control beta turned on. Basically, it will stop for a stop sign. And it'll even right now stop for a green light and you have to hit the accelerator to make sure it's safe and knows it can proceed. Um, if there's a vehicle in front of you, it will proceed through there following that vehicle if it knows it is green. Uh, green light traffic chime, if you are stopped at a stop sign, it will chime to let you know it's time to go in case you zone out or get distracted by a child or something. Um, I like to have that on just in case I miss it. I don't want to be the guy at the stoplight who's holding things back. Full self-driving visualization preview is, there's not much to it other than you see some garbage cans and traffic cones right now. Um, I think we'll be seeing a lot more in the future with new updates, so we'll keep an eye on that space. And then Summon is another feature that's still in beta where you can use the app on your phone to call the car from a parking spot and come pick you up. I did a whole video on where this is, where this technology is at this point. Um, right now it's kind of a party trick, but I expect to see some pretty big improvements through this year. So we'll keep an eye on it, but right now it's something worth testing in a non-crowded parking lot with another person as a spotter, but I wouldn't trust it in every situation. And that's, again, why some of these say beta. You are in control. And again, at the bottom we have Customize Summon, where you can kind of dig into here and set it up wherever you're comfortable, you know, depending on the parking lots or situations around you, where you live, the places you frequent. 
You might want some of these distances to be longer or shorter. You might be okay with uh, a tight clearance on the side, or you might want it standard. Um, so you're gonna, again, know what you're comfortable with. I would maybe encourage you to find a mostly empty parking lot on a you know, early morning or something and give some of these different settings a try. Um, ideally with someone else as a spotter to kind of watch to make sure it's doing the things you want it to do safely. And then you can enable standby mode whether or not you want someone to be ready for you as you're walking out of the store as it's parked. So again, just some settings, you're going to find out what works best for you. And then you can also check how autopilot does uh, set speed. When I turn it on, I want it to stay at the current speed. Or you can set it to an offset or a percentage, uh, a fixed offset or a percentage of the speed limit. Speed limit warning, I want it to display so I'm aware, but I don't want the chime because very few times are you actually driving just the speed limit. And then again, you can set a relative or absolute offset for the speed limit. Forward collision warning, I have medium set. Early is a little too panicky for me. I find medium is, is just fine for the level of attention that I'm paying. Um, lane de departure avoiding avoidance, I want the assist just in case I miss something. It's a little annoying. I have all these warnings and things turned on. It's a little annoying when you're kind of hugging a line because it's what's the natural thing to do and nothing's wrong, but you're in a situation where this is where he, where humans would drive and it's saying, no, 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 you know, take control immediately because we're getting out of the lane and it's like, okay, settle down. But I'd rather have that stuff warning me than not be aware of, you know, a potential failure on my part. Navigation, at the top we have the volume of the voice you're gonna be hearing as it's giving directions. If it's too loud or too quiet, you can, as it's speaking, you can use the scroll wheel on the left-hand side of the steering wheel to raise the volume or drop the volume of the voice to whatever's comfortable for you. Here we have it still pretty low. Um, if for in-town driving, that's fine. And then I've got toggled on automatic navigation to go to certain places. Again, we aren't in a consistent routine because we're coming out of COVID, so this never really gets enabled, but if you were in a pretty set routine, it probably would. Trip Planner Beta is uh, a good option to have on so that if I say navigate to Grand Marais, Minnesota, it's going to say, all right, you're leaving home with your 57% and you need to get there with some leftover. And so I'll use a voice command, say navigate here, and it's gonna tell me in this case that I need to stop at Hinkley for 30 minutes. This is where the more comfortable you get, the more used to trip planning and things, you can kind of customize this. If I were really doing this trip, I'd charge up to almost 100% at home, and then it probably wouldn't have me charge until Duluth. Again, that's some tactics for another day. But this also works for cross-country trips as well. So if I said, let's go see that gum wall in Seattle, I could have clicked that, navigate me there, and it would show where I need to go across the country, uh, each of the charging stops I need to make, and would navigate through that path all the way there. At this point, it doesn't do off-charging waypoints, only waypoints to make those charging stops, but we'll see again if the software advances through the next year. And enabling online routing just gives the routing a little bit better handle of what's going on currently instead of using old data to do your map. So if a road's closed and it's known about that on Google Maps, it's not going to route you through that closed pathway. And so you can set, you know, change my route if it's going to save me more than 10 minutes. Or you can set that to, again, whatever you're comfortable with. And you can also have it avoid ferries, avoid tolls, or, or use HOV lanes. I don't really use the HOV lanes, and I don't live in an area with tolls or ferries, so it's not really 
anything I need to toggle on. If I'm doing a road trip, I will turn on the avoid tolls because I hate them with a passion. Again, that's per personal preference. All right, we're working through this. We're at safety and security. This one's pretty quick and easy. Uh, allow mobile access. Yes, I want uh, my wife's phone to be able to start the vehicle and get me home if I forget my phone or break it or lose my key card or something. This just gives the opportunity to do that. Uh, power off if you need to shut the vehicle completely down. Um, you can do that here. And then here we can see sentry mode is off because I have uh, generally have it on but I have exclude home and since I'm at my home sentry mode is off. And when we were talking about the dash cam viewer and everything uh, I talked about how you don't necessarily always want to go into you know touch that icon especially if you're driving to save a clip if someone tries to run you off the road or you witness an accident or something but are still pulling over to the side um, give it a few seconds and then just honk the horn and the last 10 minutes will be recorded and you want to give it a couple seconds so you don't cut off the incident that just happened um, you want to make sure that that got logged before you honk the horn obviously if you're in a dire situation and need to use the horn don't wait use it but um, then maybe give it another few minutes and then honk again to try to get the action. And all of those sentry mode clips on the new vehicles are stored on a USB drive that comes with the car in the glove box. So you can format that here or you know take it out. You can either view clips in the clip viewer that we looked at earlier or bring them into a computer or give them to the authorities if you need to do that. Park assist chimes I leave on just because, again, I like a little warning. It gets a little annoying sometimes, but I'd rather be a little annoyed than hit something. Uh, Joe mode is supposed to lessen the volume of some of the chimes and alerts if you have sleeping kids in the car. I haven't found that it does a big, makes a big difference, but we keep it on just the same. Uh, security alarm, yeah, I want the security alarm to go off if someone breaks into the vehicle. And then pin to drive, I have a daughter who likes to play in the car, climb around in the car. She's getting tall enough where she could hit the brake. And if my phone's in the car or I'm nearby and the phone or the car thinks my phone is in the car, I don't want her to be able to put it into drive. So she might be able to hit the brake, but she wouldn't know the pin to get into a gear and hurt herself or someone else. And you can also set up a glove box pin and like we just talked about your USB drive for sentry mode is in the glove box so if someone breaks into your car and knows where that is they could open the glove box and pull that drive out and you wouldn't have any record of them breaking in. You wouldn't have images of their face or license plate and so if I were in some sketchy areas I would turn on glove box pin um, just to make sure I was keeping that dash cam footage safe if something were to happen. Generally though it's not something I worry about. Cabin overheat protection is just a way that the car will keep track of how hot it is on a hot summer day. It's not going to let the cabin get to over I think 105 degrees Fahrenheit. So that just gives a little more longevity to your computer components so you don't have melting boards and things like that. I just leave that on. I don't see a reason why you wouldn't. And then down below we have data sharing where you can toggle on different options of what information you want to share with Tesla and what level. And you can always go back and change these if you decide to do a different way of data sharing. So read through all that stuff, get a good understanding of what they're doing, turn things on or off as you're comfortable, Service tab. Generally, there's not a lot of service that's needed on Tesla's windshield wiper fluids about it, although you will need to occasionally change uh, wiper blades. And to do that, you would turn on wiper surface mode. It just brings those wipers up onto the windshield a little bit more. This is really handy during a winter storm and stuff too, um, so they don't get trapped in there and freeze uh, kind of under the hood line. If you bring them up into wiper service mode, when you turn on the defrost, that area is going to thaw at first and you'll have uh, working wipers without damaging the motors trying to get through ice. 
Then you can dig into the owner's manual, which is all right here on the screen. I'll admit I haven't read through the entire thing, but most questions should be able to be answered there. And, you know, it's kind of broken out by category, um, information in the general car, um, information on your mobile connector, and declarations of conformity, which is just regulatory stuff, as far as I understand. Coming back out, you can adjust the headlights if you need to dial that in. Really, that's not something you're going to need to worry about. As a, a user, that's something maybe a mobile tech would need to do, or someone in a service center. Uh, tow mode, if you need to just go into complete rolling mode to get it up on a flatbed, that's where you make that selection. Wheel configuration, you can change this if you're going from winter tires to summer tires, or if you change tire size, you're going to want the car to know what you've got on there. So it can adjust different things for uh, speed, mileage, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it knows what it's sensing. Notifications, if you have any alerts or warnings, that's going to be found there. If something popped up and you didn't re catch it right away, click on here and see what the latest thing was. Generally, there's nothing there. Camera calibration, again, this is something you're probably not going to need to do as a user, but that is there. And then factory reset, you're selling the vehicle and you want all of your data, your home address, anything like that, your work address, you want that to be stripped out, you do the factory reset. And then at the bottom, they give you the number for Tesla roadside assistance, or I believe you can press that and it will call through your phone if it's paired to the car. I didn't try this because obviously I don't want to be bothering roadside assistance. Finally, we come to the software tab and here we're seeing the vehicle description, uh, the VIN, the mileage, full self-driving capability, premium connectivity, basically what packages you have with the vehicle what software version you're on, and you can view the release notes for that software. Uh, it looks like my last one was just some bug fixes. You can also change your software update preference. So if you want the latest and greatest new stuff, you can switch it to advanced or leave it at standard if you want to kind of move to the back, back of the line and let other people work the bugs out first before you get your update. You can toggle this. I don't know that it does a ton, other than just makes you feel good if you want to be first that you've selected that. It seems to be a pretty random rollout when they do software updates, so who knows. And then another place where you can access the owner's manual. All right, how are you holding up? That was a lot, and that screen, you know, like I said, that's the one you're going to access the most. It's where most of the meat and potatoes of your controls are. But I also said you'll set a lot of these once and then completely forget about them and not need to access it again. So it's a lot, it's a lot to get through, but just knowing where it is and knowing most functions are in that car icon and then along those different tabs. So now let's get into some stuff that's a little more fun than service menus. And let's start with the audio. So right now, if you click the little uh, music note here, that brings up your radio or audio settings. Right now I'm paired to my phone, so it's showing a song from my phone that I was listening to before I started re recording this. And then you have different options with either the radio, uh, pairing to a phone, streaming service, karaoke, tune in, which is like podcasts and things, um, then some audio settings and searching for any music. And then most stations or streaming things that you've usually used will stay up on this lower bar and you can scroll across them and just get quick access to it. So if we click here on classic hits, we bring up Diana Ross. So I'll pause that so we don't get into trouble with YouTube. And as you can see, we can raise or lower the audio screen to cover the map or completely leave the map. The audio will still play, uh, but you'll need to hit the music notes again if you want to bring it back up. Generally, I like it at this lower tab where you're just seeing what's playing currently and able to give it a thumbs up, thumbs down, or advance to the next song. 
If we dig in here to karaoke, let's go to something that's, again, not going to get us in trouble. We'll go to before 1950 and do Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And it's a little slow, so we won't hang out here, but uh, I just want to say that this is available to be used as the car is in drive, but it's really at that point for passengers. Um, you shouldn't be driving and doing karaoke, reading the lyrics and things like that. If you're going to be in the driver's seat, be in park to do karaoke, just for safety's sake. You have options to turn on or off a helper voice. Uh, some of the songs are duets, which can be pretty fun, but it's just a fun area to play around with, again, as you're getting used to the car. If you like to sing in the shower, you're going to love this. Tune in, as I said, is podcasts and things like that, um, so you can select different things there. In the audio settings, you have a few different things you can do. Uh, tone, generally I like the sound of the audio in the car, but I did bump up the bass a little bit, just because it's what sounded right to me on the songs I love. Balance, you can move around the car, so if you're listening to a boring Tesla podcast or something and you're, the rest of your passengers don't want to listen to it, you can move the audio up into the driver's seat. Or if your kids are listening to children's music, you want to pump that in the back seat because how many times can you listen to Baby Shark? And you're still going to hear it, but it does a pretty good job. Under options, you can change the immersive sound. You can turn that off to standard or high. I don't know why you would turn immersive sound off. Why would you choose to have worse sound? But uh, I leave it on high and it works pretty well for me. Uh, DJ commentary, that's a thing. I don't know why you would want it on there, but if you do, you can toggle that on. Uh, explicit content, I'm not too worried about most of the things I'm listening to, so I just have that list uh, turned on. And allow mobile control, again, let somebody with the app control it from either remotely or within the vehicle. And the final item here is sources. And so uh, we are not subscribed to Spotify, so I toggled that one off. It just kind of cleans up that lower bar of options. So we're not seeing a bunch of things that we aren't gonna be using. Rumor has it that more options will be popping into this screen in future software updates. And that takes us through audio. So let's take a look at this little circle icon, and that's just your rear view camera, and you can bring up the side cameras as well. Now, since I'm shooting this at night, I'll dub in some other footage here from a daytime drive, and you can get a sense of what those cameras see. And you can have these running the whole time you're driving, or usually they just come on when you're in reverse. But if something funky is happening behind you, someone's coming up behind you aggressively or seems drunk and you want to capture it or make sure you know how to get out of the way of it, um, maybe it's emergency vehicles or something, you can pop this on and kind of know how to react. Next icon is windshield wipers. And this is another one that gets a lot of buzz um, on Twitter and forums and things like that. Generally, I leave the auto wipers on and they do a pretty good job. It's a little dicey in really misty or really light rain where it might not be sensing that there's a need to wipe, but as a driver, you're getting a little concerned that it's not ever going to turn on. Um, in that case, I would just bump the left-hand stock behind the steering wheel and give it one wipe manually, and that's fine. If you feel like it's going to be that way consistently, then you can just manually set it to the lowest setting here. Uh, I did that in Custer, South Dakota when it was kind of misting all day and that worked perfectly fine. But day-to-day -day, normal rainstorms, I leave it on auto and don't have issues. Again, this is something you can control with a voice command as well. And before I move on from these big items that are on the left-hand lower side, I want to talk a little bit about finding them because they are just on a touch screen. Hunting with your index finger can feel a little nebulous. Um, and so usually I'll put my fingers behind the screen and then use my thumb to actually do the selections. And so because the screen stands off a little bit, you can kind of slide it along that under edge of the screen and use that as a good way to find your way around. I think there's a company that sells like a little braille strip that goes behind it with bumps at the different buttons. 
and they might even be individualized, I'm not sure, but if that's something you feel you need and it might make you safer, um, you can obviously look into that as well. And now we come to the icon that opens up another can of worms, but it is generally a pretty fun can of worms. Uh, the first that comes up on the left hand side is your phone. I have it set to say Ahoy Hoy. The stock setting for the phone is it says call underneath. If you press and hold you get a little Easter egg where it says Ahoy Hoy. I think that's funny. I like it. So that's how I, I keep the phone icon. I also think it's hilarious that it's a super old time phone. Next you've got your calendar if you want to pair that and have different calendar events showing up when you get in the car in the morning it'll bring it up and show what things you have going on that day it's fairly handy camera is just another way to access the backup camera and side repeaters like we've seen before and then we get into one of my favorite parts of the car the energy graph and this is what I was telling you about when we were talking about whether to set your your indicator to percentage or to miles so let's take a look at this. Here you can see we can set it to be either the last 30 miles, the last 15 miles, or last 5 miles. Now generally I keep it on last 30 because I want the broadest average I can to hopefully have the most accuracy. And this will tell you what your average watt hour per mile has been on the left over that distance and with the way you've been driving what your projected range in miles is. And so here on the right hand side we can say with the way I've been driving for the last 30 miles and with 56 percent left we would have 139 miles of driving range. And so getting used to this graph and understanding it is your best way of really gauging how many real world miles you have. If you are on a trip and you are going down the interstate at a consistent rate, you are going to be able to look back at, you know, 30 miles into your trip, you are going to be able to say, wow, the weather's perfect today and I'm going to get a ton of range. Or you might be driving 84 miles an hour into a headwind with the air conditioning on and a car loaded up for a road trip and be able to look at that last 30 miles and go, oh, what we're really going to get is quite a bit less than we would have in that other situation. So being able to look at this graph and getting a clear picture of where you've been and how that's affecting your range can let you know if you need to slow down a little bit, uh, if you need to turn the AC down a little bit or the heat down depending on what your, your utilization is, or if you're hitting s smooth sailing and you can really nail it the rest of the way. Obviously driving safely is important, so I'm not encouraging that you go too fast. But once you get used to this, you can also use it in another way. Whereas if you are going over some mountains or something, and you've been climbing and climbing and climbing, and you know you're about to the summit, you might only have a handful of miles left and need to go, you know, you might only have, you know, say five or ten miles left on this graph. But you know the second you hit this crest that you can see you are going to start going downhill pretty aggressively and so you know you can push it a little bit knowing that once i hit that downhill this whole graph is going to invert and you're going to be getting uh, lots of regeneration into the battery once you get over that hillside so i would encourage you to kind of keep this up in smaller trips and get a sense of how you can use it and this is the way to get the most accurate estimation of what your real world miles really are. So that's all in the consumption tab. Then if I put a trip in here like the trip we talked about earlier to Grand Marais where I've got the car actively navigating somewhere we can click on the trip tab and it will show us a line saying we're going to leave here with 56 percent and get to our next stop in this case it would be Hinkley with 16 percent and so it's starting us off in the green and getting into yellow as we get toward Hinkley and as you drive if you're driving more aggressively or using more energy your little dot there is going to start tracing a line that goes below the estimated line if you're using less energy and driving more efficiently, let's say you're stuck in traffic or stuck behind a semi for a while, 
and you're not using nearly as much energy, your line that you're tracing is going to go above that estimated line. Now the Model Y is pretty good, and so in most cases for us, the line just follows right along the estimation line. But this is a good place to check if you're doing what the car thinks, or if you need to slow down, or you, if you can speed up to get to your destination safely. And obviously you don't want to plan to get anywhere with 0%. I have been there, and it's doable. There is a buffer under zero in most cases, but I wouldn't rely on it. And I can tell you from a couple very real experiences that once you start getting below zero, you are sweating bullets. It's not something you want to plan to do. So especially on road trips, use that energy graph, use this trip uh, line to kind of see how you're doing and make sure you're going to arrive in good shape. The next icon here is the charging tab, and that'll come up automatically when you plug into a supercharger or something, but if you want to bring it up manually, this is how you do that. You can see up on the top right, open charge port, you can open it there. You can also press on the charge port or open it with the app. Or supercharger stalls or your home connector, most of the time you can click the button on the back of the handle and that will open your charge port as well. And you can set the limit to how full you want the battery to be charged when you're plugged in. Um, daily, you can set it to as low as 50% if you're like parking for a long time and not using the vehicle and you wanna just keep the battery right in the middle, you can leave it at 50% and leave it plugged in and it's gonna be fine. Um, if you're doing daily driving, usually we'll plug it in and have it set to 80%, so every morning when we wake up, we've got 80% battery. If I'm going to a road trip, I'll bump that up to 90 or 100 if we really need to max out our range. A general rule of thumb is you don't want to charge to 80 or 90% every day, and you don't want to charge it to 90% or 100% especially, and just leave it sitting at that really high state of charge for a long time. So in most cases on a road trip situation, I would charge to 100% and have that charging end right before we take off. And so the battery has just gotten to that point, all the cells are balanced and everything's good, and then I unplug and 10 minutes later we're on the road burning off some of that juice. Uh, just for a long-term health of the battery, you don't want to be sitting at 100 for too long. Down below with home charging, you can change the charge current. I've got scheduled departure set up so that the car is ready to go. I know the charging is gonna charge overnight in the off-peak hours and be ready for me at 8 a.m. Now you can set it to precondition, but since I've been working from home for quite a while, there's no reason to precondition. I want it to be ready for me in the morning but I don't want to waste the energy to precondition if I'm not going to leave the house until 9 or 10 in the morning. Uh, but my off-peak charging time stops at 8 a.m., so I don't want it charging at a more expensive rate. And you can set that up here, but knowing what the rate differences are from your utility will be helpful here. And you can set this to be all week or just weekdays. And you can see my last charge was up in Baxter, Minnesota, uh, $14 for supercharging that day. So that's just kind of handy to have your last supercharging info up there. Not something I reference a lot, but it's nice to have there. Next little icon down here is the internet, and you all understand what the internet is. You're on it right now. So pretty easy to follow. I had some kids I was showing the car, and they were looking up uh, Roblox and wanting to play that on the screen and so that's why that screen came up. But this is a good time to bring up one of my favorite planning tools, a better route planner. You can actually pair this to your vehicle and having this in the web browser in your car, you can see this is the trip we plan to Custer, uh, but you can have the a better route planner actually following your car's state of charge and location and will make their predictions very accurate. So this is a cool thing to pair with your car if you're comfortable doing that. Uh, it's a really safe and secure way that they do that. Um, they're not actually logging into your account. They get a token from Tesla 
uh, that just gives them some very basic information. So pretty secure, pretty useful. If you're doing a lot of road tripping, uh, this is a nice thing to have up on the web in your car. We're about to do a huge road trip around Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and come back to Minnesota, and I will probably have this set up for that trip. The next tab is entertainment, and on the arcade side, we see all these different games. Now, I did a huge rundown video with the guys from the Five Count, where they kind of ran through each game, gave their thoughts on it. Um, we didn't hit quite all of them, but you'll get a pretty good sense of what the games are in that video, if that's something you're interested in. Some can be played with the steering wheel, some are played just on the screen, and some you can use an Xbox controller to control the characters. So some pretty fun options here. Uh, again, something to explore in your free time, just knowing this is where it is. Then under the theater tab, we've got Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, Twitch, and Tesla tutorials. So if you want a little lighter depth tutorials from Tesla, they aren't as thorough as what you're seeing here. Um, but if you want just some basic information, they have some of that, those things in those Tesla tutorials. I find a lot of cases if I want a deep dive, YouTube is a better option than these tutorials, but it's good that they're there. And speaking of YouTube, you can bring up some of your favorite YouTubers. Even if they're a little blown out in this camera shot, you can watch YouTube videos or Netflix or any of the other uh, streaming things right in your vehicle. And when you're charging or waiting for someone to come out of a grocery store or appointment or something, um, this stuff is really fantastic to have. And then we're gonna take a quick look at the toy box. And I'm actually gonna fade out here and let me from last night walk you through that because there are some audio things in here that I want you to be able to hear. Toy box is similar to entertainment, but obviously it's more toys. So we have the emissions testing mode. Where you can entertain kids for hours or adults too. And you can have that turn on your turn signal or on demand when you press the squirrel wheel. I'd caution against turning it on for the turn signal. It's funny, but I accidentally hit the turn signal while in a drive-thru and started farting at the person giving us our food. It was a little awkward. Um, Boombox, you can play either current media or change the horse sound. All sorts of fun stuff. Um, uh, you can have it change the driving sound, so as you're driving it will play snake jazz or coconuts or rock and roll, or ice cream, uh, like an ice cream truck sound. That's kind of fun, but it does get a little old, so I wouldn't leave it on for too long. Or just have that sound playing during summon. So that's kind of fun outside the car sound. Tracks is a little bit confusing, but it's a it's a synthesizer program, so you can do. you can make loops, you can make beats, you can do all sorts of fun stuff. I haven't had a ton of time to play with it, but it's you can get pretty in-depth with it. Uh, romance mode is turns off this into a fireplace, which looks really super cool. And it turns on the heat on one side and the cool on the other side, so the windows fog up. And if you Tap the screen, I think you get some romantic music. But you can play uh, your Al Green or whatever you want to play while you have romance mode on. I think that fire looks super sweet, and uh, I wish you could leave it on like while you're driving because it's super relaxing. But I'm guessing it wouldn't be too safe to leave that on all the time. Sketchpad is just little sketch pad you can change colors you can make some things that are relatively elaborate but it's 
you know, just kind of a, a little bit of a time waster fun thing. Um, Mars, you can turn that on and then your map and your vehicle turns into a little rover and you're on the surface of Mars, so that's fun. Rainbow Road plays the uh, Saturday Night Live Don't Fear the Reaper bit with Christopher Walken. I'm going to need more cowbell and puts you on a rainbow road as you're driving. Santa Mode does pretty much the same thing, only your vehicle turns into a Santa Tesla sleigh with reindeer. And then as you're driving, all the other vehicles around you show up as other reindeer. So pretty fun during the holidays. Your turn signal turns into jingle bells, which can get a little annoying, but kind of fun in December if you're into that kind of thing. And coming out of the toy box, that's where we're going to leave it. We made it through all the entire screen, and now I'm sure we're about due for a software upgrade that's going to change all this. But hopefully it got you comfortable with the different kind of icons that Tesla uses, where they place them, and why, and makes it a little easier as you get used to your vehicle to understand where to find some of those basic things. Like I said before, most of the time you're setting a lot of these things and then never using them again or never changing the settings. I hope this video has been helpful. If it has, please feel free to like, share, subscribe, all that stuff. If it hasn't, why did you sit through this whole thing? <laughs> but I appreciate that you did. Have a great day. I'll catch you in the next one with some more excitement as we do some road trips and explore some other things in the EV world. So thank you. Again, have a great day, and I'll catch you in the next one.